Before sunrise, freezing cold winter's morning, got ice on the kayak, but I'm heading out in these perfect conditions to take a look at one of the more remarkable coastal fortifications in Britain. It's called Hurst Castle and it's recently suffered a devastating collapse into the sea. Part of its structure has been undermined by the time and tide so I'm going to check it out. You don't see the sun in this flat many days of the year. This is very special. The perfect day going to investigate some Henrician fortifications, the so-called device forts. By the 16th century, a new piece of military technology was changing, well, everything really, it was changing the way battles were fought, but it was also changing the way defences were built and that was the cannon, a gunpowder weapon capable of firing a projectile, a cannonball, hundreds of metres. So for the first time it became a realistic possibility that you could actually defend the coast, you could stop people landing by having a series of forts, castles, blockhouses, all armed with cannon and they would keep any ship away from the shore and stop them landing troops. And in the 1530s and 1540s King Henry VIII of England needed that technology because he had enraged the two greatest powers of Europe, Catholic powers, France and the Holy Roman Empire, by divorcing his wife. The great powers of Europe threatened to invade England and in response, Henry, his coffers full from the dissolution of the monastery, the wealth that he took from the great Catholic monastic houses around England. Uh, with that wealth, he built a series of forts, of castles. And Hurst Castle, I'm coming up to now, is one of the more famous. I'm just coming up here now, I can start to see the damage that has been caused by the terrible effect of the wind, the frost, the tide and the waves, it's pretty significant. I suppose if there is good news, it's that perhaps it's worth remembering that this is the collapse has taken part, place in the Victorian section. In the late 19th century, there was another invasion scare. And very much like Henry VIII, they spent a vast amount of money on coastal fortifications. This castle was massively expanded. It started that section that has collapsed. What a shame. It's a pretty bad collapse. Well, I've come around here just to the west of the collapse now, and the bad news is, is that it's very badly undermined right the way along here, underneath the parts of this uh, Victorian fort, which are still standing. It's only a matter of time before this collapses. I mean, I can see about a metre at least in under the foundations. Oh dear, it's going to need some really serious emergency shoring up. reality of these Henrician forts is one or two of them already disappeared into the sea over the centuries and if you build things this close to the English Channel it'll get you in the end. So this castle was built in the early 1540s. There's the Henrician bit, you can see the rounded, they do almost look more like a medieval castle, you can see the architectural tradition that the builders have grown up in. You can see the sort of rounded bastions and sort of castle-like towers. And then next to it, these 
slightly more brutal squat Victorian gun positions. The arches, you can see the arches, the reinforced ceiling so that they could take, uh, they could take the weight of the artillery pieces above. Like many expensive defence projects, this never really saw service in the way that it was intended. The war with France and the Holy Roman Empire, it was over really before any serious attempt to invade was launched. French forces entered the Channel, the famous incident where the Mary Rose capsized. There was a, a naval battle, but these forts didn't play a huge part. And it was in later centuries that the fort was added onto. One interesting thing about this fort is that King Charles I was imprisoned here, Hurst Castle. So like all British castles, this one's had a long and very varied history. One that couldn't possibly have been imagined by the, by the man who commissioned it, Henry VIII. And it saw service in the First and Second World War. It was improved, it, you know, anti-aircraft guns were put on it to protect Southampton, Portsmouth from attack, which is two big important cities, ports just down there. You can certainly see why he built this fort here. It's the narrowest point of the Solent, a very important stretch of water uh, in the south of England, the middle of the south of England. So Hurst Castle was on, on this spit to try and block off this western entrance to the Solent, a hugely important stretch of water for the English crown. And it remained so for 400 years. Now, one of the problems with this new bit of technology, this cannon, was that you could fire a few hundred metres, but you couldn't just build one big central fort and block off the whole of the Solent. It wasn't like a few hundred years later when big artillery pieces were capable of firing 10, 15 miles. So to really try and protect the Solent from enemy fleet, you had to build not just one of these castles, but lots of them. So I'm going to go and check out a few more. Some of them, very obvious. Some of them have disappeared over the years. Some of them are still there, but hidden. Hi, Captain. Can I have a lift? <laughs> in the middle of the most dangerous stretch. <laughs> you see that boat? Okay. Next stop, Yarmouth on the Isle of Wight. This is Yarmouth Castle. It was built in about 1544, and fascinatingly, a bit of a metaphor, it wasn't just built with money that Henry had got from dissolving the monasteries, but it was literally built with stone quarried from a nearby monastery that was no longer in use. So Henry turned monasteries in this case, into castles. Yarmouth Castle is much smaller than Hurst Castle, as you can see. It remains the size it was when it was built uh, by Henry VIII. It never was expanded by the Victorians. Um, there was a, about 20 people, a garrison of about 20 people there. The head of the castle lived in it, and his garrison lived in the town. They had well, about six cannon, and those were never really fired in anger. These Henrician forts never fulfilled the task that the king had hoped they would, which was blocking the Solent to an enemy fleet sailing up here. It's like most coastal fortifications ever since. You're much better off spending the money in battleships out at sea that can stop an enemy fleet far off your shore than waiting until they get this close and trying to sink them with cannons. It's the first castle of its kind in the UK. It has a special arrow-shaped bastion sticking out on the landward side, a brand new development, cutting-edge technology from Europe, which meant that defenders had better fields of fire and they could shoot muskets and artillery at any attacking force. So even this little castle here, hidden away on the Isle of Wight, is actually an essential piece of engineering history. Classic British scene, this, I love it. In towns and villages all around the country, you get these remarkable bits of history, a vitally important Henrician fortification in this case, wedged between a ferry terminal and the George Hotel. And in the middle there, the castle, it's a tourist attraction.
now we head along the coast of the Isle of Wight to the port town of Cowes. Here at the mouth of the Medina River, one of Henry VIII's castles is hiding in plain sight. It has morphed over the last 150 years into becoming one of the most famous, iconic buildings in the world of sailing. This used to be West Cowes Castle. It is now the Royal Yacht Squadron. Henry VIII's castle built here on the west side of the Medina to protect uh, the river heading into the Isle of Wight. Uh, it fell into disuse, only fired its guns, we think, in anger once during the Civil War in the 1640s. Uh, then it fell into disuse and it was rented in the 19th century by a sailing club, the Royal Yacht Squadron. And since then, it's been the, the HQ of Cow's Week, one of the most famous regattas on earth. A place where once Kaiser Wilhelm himself of Germany would come and race his uncle, Edward VII, in these waters off Cow's. And now it's been transformed almost beyond recognition, but you can still see round the base that half moon shaped outer wall with gaps left for the cannon. It's just recognizably one of Henry VIII's castles. For our last Henry Sheen castle, we're heading back to the mainland and I'm getting back in the kayak. This is Calshot Castle. Built on a spit of land that sits at the bottom of Southampton Water, the narrow inlet that goes up to the city of Southampton. One of the great ports of England. Remains so to this day, hence the big container ships and the tankers coming up behind me. Southampton was the port from which Henry V left to invade France for the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. It's the port from which hundreds of thousands of men left in the Second World War to take part in the amphibious landing on Normandy, D-Day. And so it's always been a hugely important place in the English national story. It's the place closest to the ancient Anglo-Saxon capital at Winchester as well, which is just up beyond Southampton, up in Hampshire. So this is a really, really important waterway here. And so at the very mouth of it, the narrowest point, Henry VIII built this fort here, Calshot. Very powerful. You can see why it must have been such exciting technology. They thought for the first time in human history, you could actually deny, it was like an area denial weapon on a, on a big scale. These cannons pointing out here could reach almost across to the other bank, the other shore over there, almost. Not quite, and they could actually stop an enemy fleet from threatening Southampton at all. And Southampton through the Middle Ages had been raided several times by an enemy force. The French, the French came up here in the 14th century and burned Southampton to the ground, enslaved and killed its people. This threat was real, and Henry VIII was spending a vast amount of money on a hugely ambitious national plan to protect England's shores. Nothing like this really had been attempted since the Romans. It shows the scale of the crisis he faced. The two great superpowers of Europe, both uh, allied with each other, determined to invade England. But it also shows the increasing ambition of the early English state. That Henry VIII thought he could spend this vast amount of money to build a national network protecting his shores. These buildings must have been so futuristic in the 16th century and the giant bronze and iron cannon sitting on their battlements must have seemed like miracle weapons. You could try and stop a fleet entering this stretch of water at ranges that hitherto were, would have been impossible. Cannonballs could skip across the water and they could, well, they could still do damage at 500 meters. So this castle here could almost close this stretch of water to an enemy fleet, protecting Southampton uh, and protecting Winchester beyond. Calshot Castle with a permanent garrison of around 15. Uh, it had 36 guns by the late 1540s. So I imagine that local militia, local levies would have come in to help fire those guns in the event of a, an invasion, in the event of a crisis. Like Yarmouth Castle, 
like cows, the stones, the building blocks for Calshot were actually often taken from the abbeys, the buildings that Henry VIII was dissolving. Uh, he took their treasure to help pay for the castles and he took the very fabric of their walls and their buildings to help build his castles. These castles don't just symbolise Henry VIII's break with the Catholic Church, his refusal to obey the Pope in Rome, but they embody it. The very structure of these buildings, their walls, their masonry, the stone, is torn from the Catholic monasteries that Henry ripped down. The really amazing thing about Calshot is that it remained in service then until the mid 20th century, up to and beyond the Second World War. It became an important seaplane base in the First World War. It was a perfect place for float planes to take off and keep U-boats away from this important part of the coast and this stretch of the channel. Um, after the war, it became the base where very fast aircraft, the ancestors of the Spitfire, were first raced down here as seaplanes. And so Henry VIII's military fortification saw well, over 400 years of service. One of my favourite castles, this one. I love it. Still very recognisable, although it's been changed, of course, that original Tudor shape in Jaws. It's in a magnificent position, guarding the Narrows. And it's played its part in so many subsequent parts of history, not just the 16th century, but later periods when the threat had changed beyond all recognition. Anti-submarine patrols were based out of here. Early aviation has played its part over more than 400 years. And this is the way to see it from the water. It's been a real treat getting a sea view of these four extraordinary castles. All part of Henry's grand plan, yet each one unique. Some of them have gained a new life, whilst others are fighting a losing battle against the elements. I just hope that we can find a way to protect them for the next five centuries. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.